Test, there we go. I'm gonna try not to hunch, but let's see. Okay, can everybody hear me? Good. Okay, welcome everybody. Nice to see everyone. Um, again, my name is Andrew and um, those of you who've been to my previous talks um, may know that um, I often talk about Okay. We're okay, I think. Okay, is that good? Okay. So as I was saying, I often talk about psychological aspects of Buddhism because that's my comfort zone. Um, and I decided to step out of my comfort zone for this talk. Um, and usually, lately I've been picking the talks and so I asked Mama if, if he would give me a topic. So this is his topic for me today. And um, be careful what you wish for uh, in terms of a challenge. <laughs> um, it definitely stretched me. The challenges is, are how we grow, right? So. Um, this is my best understanding of this topic. I always feel like I, I need to put a caveat in there. I'm, uh, maybe it's obvious to you, but I need to tell myself as well. Like, uh, this is just my interpretation. So take take it with a grain of salt. Um, if something doesn't seem right, double check it with Lama or with Ruby. I think that's what we do in uh, Refuge Sangha Big Talks. Is we're kind of grappling with, with this material together. But, so we talked today is on karma and mahamudra specifically what is their relationship um, in mahamudra teachings it can be interpreted sometimes um, that you could bypass karma but um, my talk is really looking at that if that's really true or not um, and so we're going to try to look at how we reconcile both karma and mahamudra um, some of you may not have, like me, a firm grasp on karma and Mahamudra. So I'm going to start with um, an overview of each of them um, and how they fit into Buddhist teaching. Um, by the way, uh, my sources for this talk are Darshan with Lama and two books by Trale Gabdan Rinpoche. Um, one is Mind at Ease. This is um, a Mahamudra book, and the other, fittingly, Karma. What it is, what it is, what it isn't, why it matters. I really like this author. Uh, he's a Tibetan with a full command of English, so um, and he writes beautifully. He takes these really complicated concepts and makes them feel not so complicated. So I highly recommend both of these books. And also uh, a book by Geshe Tashi Sering I, I added to this. So my guess is that um, more, of you, more of you have heard of karma or know more about karma than Mahamudra. Um, even if you never came to Buddhism, you've heard of karma. Um, karma is like everywhere. It's not just a Buddhist concept, but it's kind of pervaded popular culture, right? We have, uh, did you know there's a brew pub in town called Karma? <laughs> it's a brew pub. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, and then there's, of course, all the uh, popular music, right? We've got uh, Instant Karma, John Lennon, Karma Police by Radiohead, uh, Karma Chameleon by Culture Club. I don't think there's been any hit songs about Mahamudra. If it was, the Beastie Boys probably get it. <laughs> um, so in the West, it seems like we think we know about karma. But I think that oftentimes, our, our, what we bring from popular culture about karma is not the same as what it's intended in Buddhism. So I want to, you know, I think in, in the Western culture, we look at like, um, 
this direct correlation that karma is a punishment for our sins in some way. I kept seeing this bumper sticker that said, I saw that karma. <laughs> like karma is always watching, right? Um, or people getting, you know, kind of gleeful about if someone's done something wrong or bad or bad to them, you know, karma is going to get you. Like, I can't wait till you come go down to the karma, which of course is, is, uh, you know, wishing ill on others is a, a, going to create karmic ripening on yourself. So it, it's kind of defeating the purpose. So I want to kind of start with the Buddhist conception of karma is to talk about where it first started. And that was in the Pali Canon, which is the original teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha, and I apologize, I'm going to probably read more than I usually do for this talk, but uh, try not to do too much. So the Buddha taught that wholesome actions, which are those free from attachment, aversion, and ignorance, right, the three poisons, wholesome actions lead to happiness and eventually liberation. And unwholesome actions, which are based on those three poisons, lead to suffering. He further elaborated on karma in his teaching of the 12 links of dependent origination. The Pali text described karma as volitional action or intentional action, uh, which is a culmination of ignorance and craving. So from ignorance and craving comes karma or volitional action, which is enacted either mentally or physically. Um, a karmic act has three stages that determine whether it's complete or incomplete. Stage one is intention. So you intend to do something. Stage two is action. You take the action that you intend. And three is satisfaction. You have some uh, sense that you know, this is good that you have done this act in some way. So intention is the will, you know, wanting to do something, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral. Right, so we often think about this in a negative term, but there's positive karma, right? Wholesome karma. Without intention, the mind does not move toward an action. That kind of follows logically, right? Um, actions are very rarely spontaneous. So after intention comes the action itself, which could be physical, verbal, or mental. After we complete the action, we experience a sense of relief or satisfaction. And these three stages complete a karmic act. You might think that most actions are incomplete because we don't off we often do things without intention, like by reflex. But intention can also refer to these more unconscious drives. Our motivations can arise spontaneously from unconscious concerns. This is like the stuff of Freud, right? Um, we don't know sometimes why we do things, but there's an unconscious process that's going on that, that makes us do that. So if we think about it, there's these unconscious and habitual intentions happening all the time. So we're generating karma all the time. You know, Obama has an example. That have you, those of you in Darshan, have you seen him do this? He says, that's karma. That's karma. This is just intending to move my arm, take that action, that's karma. So it's that, that simple even, if we think about karma that way. According to Buddhism, Buddhism, as long as there's consciousness, there are at least six different types of minds operating, and one of these is intention. So because intention is continually present during all activity, we're creating karma continually. However, if there's a clear sequence when we act, first intention, then action, then satisfaction, the result will be different from the result of an action with no definite sequence. So, for example, if you inadvertently kill someone with your car in an accident, the karmic result will not be as heavy as if you, it was premeditated murder because you hadn't formed that intention in advance. So, I think it's also sometimes helpful, instead of thinking of bad and good karma, to think of unwholesome and wholesome karma. So, unwholesome karma would be that uh, that's in the service, karmic acts that are in the service of the mind that's influenced by delusion. And wholesome would be in the service of the mind of bodhicitta, which is again, the mind of wisdom and compassion, that aspirational mind. That's the mind that accumulates uh, merit, positive karma, which is merit. So this is what Lama says about it. If our karma wasn't overall more wholesome than unwholesome, we wouldn't be here studying the Dharma. Yay. 
<laughs> we create our own world. We're not under the fate of gods. The Buddha taught that we are creating our emotional experiences in our world through our actions. Karma ultimately is an empowering law. We have the freedom to choose our path. This is the incredible freedom that human beings have, right? The precious human rebirth. Even though karma is a relative truth, it is pointing toward the ultimate nature of mind. The Buddha is talking about intentional action as a skillful way of demonstrating the ultimate nature of mind. The Buddha taught karma to teach how we can practice and create the world of liberation through our ethical conduct. Knowing that we have these choices empowers us to act upon these choices. The practice of the six perfections generates wholesome karma, which creates the right causes and conditions to realize enlightenment. When our intentions are good, we're creating wholesome karma through relative bodhicitta. Until we are a Buddha, our intentions will always be based on ignorance. There's still some exhaust coming out. This exhaust is karma. In Hinayana's view, there's an overfocus on karma as if, as in, if I do this, what's going to happen as a result? Which can lead to perfectionism and ultimately discouragement. You cannot become a full Buddha by being an arhat. This is still Lama talking. Karma is intention. We tend to get caught up in the idea of generating negative karma and that when we have to endure or anticipate, and then we have to endure or anticipate enduring its results. But this forgets that if karma is intention, then there is such a thing as pure intention or compassionate intention. Buddhists generate this type of karma spontaneously, not the kind of delusional karma that produces afflictive results. When we think about karma, we should think about the strength of the intention as well. The stronger it is, the more powerful, useful, or dangerous its results. And this is his analogy. Is wishing Trump to be dead as powerful as hiring a hitman to take him out? Is wishing Trump to be dead as powerful as hiring a hitman to take him out? So that's, that's a more powerful karmic result, right? Uh, you're actually taking more of an action instead of just having this mental aspiration. So that's uh, your whirlwind tour of karma. I'll stop here and see if there's any questions or comments. Yeah. That would be uh, uh, create negative uh, karma for you, unwholesome and bad karma. Can you give me an example? And then you see that person gets fired and you have remorse for having talked to the boss. So when we think about karma being generated continuously, this is why we don't want to get so wrapped up in every single thing that we do, because it's, it's happening all day long, all day, every day. Um, some things are more subtle and some things are more extreme. Um, if we focus more on the mind of uh, aspiration, the mind of enlightenment, generating passionate uh, wisdom karma, then we don't get so hung up on, did, is this a good karma or bad karma? Because we're, we're creating bad karma and wholesome karma all day long. It, but we can intentionally create wholesome karma. And so, and I was actually doing this, uh, preparing this talk, I was up in Mendocino um, on vacation, and I'm sitting in the hot tub in this beautiful spot and my mind is going to all these negative places. And while I'm working on this talk, you know, I'm thinking I have to intentionally cultivate 
a mind of positivity. I can't just be, the default is often just to stay in these negative places. So we have to, we have to cultivate that positivity instead of focusing so much on the, um, just the default negativity. Next, that's just, okay. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, that, I mean, we'll get to kind of some of that later when it relates to Mahamudra and why Mahamudra seems to want to bypass all of this obsession with was that good karma or not. Susan. Yeah. Anyway, I was just thinking about her comments and um, th there's this tremendous interdependence and, and overlapping. So what I do, I think, I never think that what I do is separate and independent from everything else that there is, right? So I can't. I can't get the full, I mean, it isn't, it isn't like a, a, a laser beam, right? It's more like a shotgun. So, you know, like I do something, but there's ripples. So how can I say that I'm the cause of all of that? I mean, that's just not, that there be, right. There may be me. both positive and negative karma. Um, happening at the same time. There may be wholesome and unwholesome karma happening at the same time uh, because it's so pervasive and all-encompassing. Um, right. And I think, you know, this is part of why, um, you know, we do uh, Vajrasapa. Is we're, we're thinking about um, what have we done? Uh, what have we thought? What have we uh, intended? And, um, it's important that we kind of continue to be mindful of that um, so that we can turn our mind toward aspirational thoughts and actions like that, to purify like that. We can't undo our previous karma, but we reset our mindset to focus on generating merit and, and wisdom like that. So any other, yeah, Daniel. Uh, you said that a karmic action um, has three steps. Mm -hmm. Is it only karmic action that has karmic results or do each of the steps are they each weighted like intention that's like 30 percent and then <laughs> you know i i don't know the answer to that i'm sorry i don't think it's that reductionistic though um again it's more probably think thought of as on a spectrum like you know again like if you uh are driving your car and you're and you're on your phone and you kill somebody um that's different than seeing them and mowing them down because you hate them, right? So we're looking at um, more the full spectrum of what did you intend with that? And again, it could be on the positive side too. So hopefully I'm generating some, some merit by sitting here and teaching today um, because that's my aspiration is to benefit you. So um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. And again, I, I'm kind of loving these questions because I think we're, this will be helpful when we get to the Mahamudra piece uh, to, th to be thinking about how people tend to think about karma in these ways. Are we ready to move forward? Any online people? Hi, sorry, I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so using that example of the cell phone and the car, like, what about, like, obviously, you wouldn't intend to hurt somebody in that way. But if you knew that you were taking a risk by being on a cell phone while driving, would that also not be, it, it's not an intention, but it's like taking a risk that could potentially harm people. Would that be negative karma? Absolutely. And again, we're, we're creating uh, negative karma throughout the day. And as well, we're hopefully creating positive karma throughout the day. So uh, it's not like uh, we can bypass negative karma. The only way you bypass negative karma ultimately is to become enlightened. So that's why it's, um, we want to think about these things. We don't want to be mindless and, and uh, 
ignorant and unintentional about the consequences of our actions. At the same time, we don't want to get into the weeds with um, how many negative actions did I have and, and now I'm screwed because I, you know, I, I thoughtlessly got on my cell phone and almost had an accident. Oh, that's terrible. You know, try to course correct, but, but don't over-focus on um, you know, this badness that's going to result because that takes you away from the mind of enlightenment, if that makes sense. Because ultimately we want to transcend karma. So can we bypass it or do we transcend it? And so let's talk about Mahamudra, um, if that's okay. Hopefully that answered your question. Oh, okay, Roberta, later. Did you have something, Roberta? It's okay, go ahead and I'll um, try to remember later, no problem. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Mahamudra. Um, and I think that a good way to understand Mahamudra is to understand its principles in comparison to the other Buddhist approaches. So um, things often develop in relationship to um, you know, the, the progression of Buddhism from the time of the, the original, or not the original, but the Shakyamuni Buddha. So Tralakyabhyan breaks down the understanding of the different vehicles of the path to enlightenment. So bear with me. I think it's pretty interesting. So they're known as yanas, the vehicles. So uh, Hinayana is the original vehicle, otherwise known as the small vehicle. Um, it denotes, it includes the fundamental doctrines of the Buddha, including the Four Noble Truths, selflessness, dependent origination, karma, and individual liberation within nirvana. In Hinayana, we renounce our self-cherishing attitude, which binds us to suffering through afflictive emotions generated by our, our unwholesome actions. So our unwholesome actions are what create our uh, afflictive emotions, our kleshas, as they're called. So when we're when we feel that suffering, it's, it's from Hinayana viewpoint, it's from our negative actions. The second vehicle is Mahayana, which is known as the great vehicle or the exoteric teachings. In Mahayana, we aim to reconcile and purify our afflictive emotions through wisdom and compassion and the practices of the six perfections. We aim to realize that wisdom and ignorance have the same underlying reality of emptiness through the methods of our compassionate intention and action and meditative insight into the nature of reality. So if Hinayana is renunciation, Mahayana is purification. The third vehicle is Vajrayana, also known as the esoteric vehicle or the diamond vehicle, introduced in India around the fifth century and in Tibetan Buddhist traditions around the seventh century. It is considered the accelerated path to enlightenment. Goal in Vajrayana is the transformation of our defiling mental states and emotional conflicts. Instead of thinking that liberation must come from a source other than our defiled minds, we come to realize that the very things that afflict us can be the source of our liberation. It is not the emotions themselves that are the source of our pain, but rather our lack of clear insight into the true nature of these emotions. This is why we do visualization of deity practices, special breathing exercises, reciting of mantras and chanting, in order to transform these afflictive emotions into wisdoms that can free and transform us. So if Hinayana and Mahayana are renunciation and purification, Vajrayana is transformation. The final vehicle is the Mahamudra path, sometimes called the Sahajayana vehicle or the vehicle of self-liberation. In Mahamudra, we are not trying to renounce, purify, or transform anything at all. Instead, the idea is to let our negativities and conflicting emotions become self-liberated. Mahamudra view is that in trying to get rid of conflicting emotions, we are perpetuating a negative view of things. Ultimately, these kleshas have no intrinsic nature, and Mahamudra aims to cut through kleshas instead of trying to wear them out, eliminate them, or transform them. Rather than going through this long process of elimination, purification, and transformation, we simply enter immediately into our spiritual being or rest in our natural state. If we can do this, liberation is automatic. Self-liberation comes through resisting the temptation to deliberately try to create a particular state of mind. 
Instead, we allow ourselves to be with whatever arises in the mind. When we allow things to come and go without fixating on them and without trying to solidify, correct, uh, correct or react to them, everything becomes self-liberated. So when we hear that self-liberation comes through resisting the temptation to deliberate, deliberately try to create a particular state of mind, and karma is defined as intention, we can see how some might read this as Mahamudra approach is bypassing the focus on creating wholesome karma. I want to look a little more at the history of Mahamudra and some of his ideas. Uh, this is from Roger Jackson, that's Professor Emeritus of Asian Studies at Carleton College. Mahamudra started in uh, India, started developing, um, as did its spiritual cousin Dzogchen in the 8th century and was transmitted to Tibet during the 8th and 12th centuries, where it was incorporated into the various lineages, but is most associated with the Kagyu lineage. Mahamudra is known as the Great Seal. This is uh, Professor Jackson. Dzogchen and Mahamudra often are presented through a rhetoric of immediacy, which insists that the surest way to attain Buddhahood is to cut to the chase by transcending ritual, dropping concepts, overcoming duality, and seeing and living out our true nature right here and now. Although their self-identification as easy paths is belied by their insistence on devotion to the spiritual master, and the practice of renunciation, compassion, wisdom, and other virtues. So this, this idea of cutting through um, straight to self-liberation, uh, bypassing some of these uh, more challenging paths of renunciation or transformation, um, that idea with Mahamudra, that direct realization of nature of mind with karma that always there intentionality of wholesome and unwholesome acts, the need for cultivating a mind of wholesomeness, that con continual emphasis on cultivation, bypass versus cultivation, right? So this is where some have interpreted that Mahamudra allows you to bypass karma. So this is where we're gonna try to reconcile this. Is this really true or not? So Trala Rinpoche says this about it. This tension between cultivation and non-cultivation of Buddhism with regard to the approach we tend to take in dealing with our mind tends to be misconstrued. Dealing at an active deliberate level with positive thinking and working on our habits seems to conflict in some people's minds with the letting go approach or the direct realization of mind approach as exemplified in practices such as Mahamudra. Indeed, karma and rebirth tend to be thought of as belonging to a very basic level of Buddhism and are mentioned almost apologetically among some seasoned practitioners and commenters who look at the real stuff of Mahamudra, Dzogchen, and Tantra. This attitude misses the point that karma, cultivated properly, teaches us how to get out of the predicament we have landed ourselves in through karmic behavior. We need to use karma to free ourselves from karma. In other words, it is not the case that we free ourselves from karma by doing something else, by circumventing karma, somehow bypassing it. On the contrary, we must use karma to free ourselves from karma. This is what the Buddha taught. Whenever we discuss matters of self-cultivation, we are talking about karma. Even in a Mahamudra or Dzogchen context, the reason it is said that we should desist from thinking on karma or cause and effect is not because it is thought to be false or unreal, but because it is created by mental imprints. The approach of these traditions is to avoid getting fixated on the idea of creating or not creating karma, which might of its own help us relinquish certain karmic impediments. In taking this type of meditation approach, unbeknownst to us, we would still be engaged in a form of karmic self-cultivation. To not be obsessive, to not be too fixated, is part of the cultivation of a wholesome karmic outlook. To not be fixated on karma is a way of cultivating karma in a proper fashion. A more simplistic way of looking at it, this is me now, is that if being able to see through the nature of mind were so easy, many of us probably wouldn't be sitting here today. We have attained a fortunate rebirth because of our karma but we're still on the influence of afflictive emotions because until we're enlightened, 
we're still operating from minds under the influence of delusion and impurity. These afflictive emotions are like clouds in the sky or agitated water with sediment. Cultivating bodhicitta or the mind of enlightenment is the cultivation of a wholesome karmic outlook, the mind of compassion and wisdom. When these two are joined, the clouds part, the sediment settles, and can see through more easily to the nature of mind. It may be that Mahamudra is a more direct path to ultimate realization, but you can't, you not only can't bypass karma to get there, you need wholesome karma to get there. Before one practices Mahamudra meditation, you begin with contemplating the four preliminaries and the four immeasurables, uh, which helps to motivate you to partake of and benefit from the practices of tranquility and insight meditation. One of the preliminaries is to contemplate karmic cause and effect. So we see again that karma is not forgotten in traditional Kagyu Mahamudra. Charlie Rinpoche says that from a relative standpoint, we have to think very seriously about karma in order to motivate us to accumulate merit through compassionate action. If we're not thinking about the, the, uh, the four preliminaries, including karma, cause, and effect, then we don't care so much about the, the path. We look for, for other numbing agents or, or uh, relative things that we can do just to kind of ease the pain, right? But we want more than that in Buddhism. Um, from the wisdom side, which understands that phenomena have no intrinsic reality, we cannot get fixated on karma since our accumulation of wisdom through our tranquility and insight meditation leads us to eliminate the effects of karma on the relative level and enables us to gain insight into the nature of ultimate reality. So the only way out of karma is enlightenment. Um, we'll always be generating karma until then. I love this. Um, one of the things I love about Lama, of many, is uh, we share a love of analogies. And so this is his analogy of the relationship between Mahamudra and karma. Um, who here has been to Darshan at Middleway Health? Uh, okay, so, so some of you, at least. Um, it's over on, right across from McKinley Park, if that helps. Okay, if you haven't been there before. So um, you're sitting in his Darshan office, if you will. Um, you can imagine it's a little more easily. But um, if you ask him, how do you get to McKinley Library or Clooney Library? And he says, you know, go downstairs, turn left, go to the crosswalk, turn right. He says, that is sutras and shastras. Um, if he says, just look out the window, it's right there. See, it's right there. That's Mahamudra. You still have to get there on your own. And the directions can come in handy, but it sure helps knowing that it's right over there, so you're motivated to get there. Your karma is your intention to get there. Along the way, you might get distracted by a phone call or an encounter with someone along the way, or, or what a nice duck pond, or watching the kids at the playground. Um, that's also karma. It's also karma to get back to your intention to go there and start walking there again, right? Karma is intention. The more pure your intentions, the better the result. If we beat someone up on the way to Clooney Library, our mind is gonna be afflicted when we get there. Uh, if we haven't already been arrested and taken to jail, right? That's also karma. Uh, another analogy I like, um, is he has a, a labyrinth. Does anyone, you guys have walked a labyrinth or you've seen a labyrinth, right? Um, the idea of like you can see the center of the labyrinth, but you have to walk this circuitous path to get to it. But it sure helps knowing that there's a center, right? So the center, pointing to the center, that's Mahamudra. Walking the, the labyrinth is karma. One of the most well-known Mahamudra teachings is the Ganges Mahamudra, which is Talopa's teaching to Naropa. Talopa was a Mahasiddhi living at the beginning of the 11th century in India. It's also known as Talopa's Mahamudra song. So Lama wanted me to, to take a couple of the verses and, and show how they might be thought of as bypassing karma, but how they're not. This is verse six. The darkness of a thousand eons cannot dim the brilliant radiance that is the essence of the sun. Likewise, eons of samsara cannot dim the sheer clarity that is the essence of your mind. 
So this is Lama's commentary on this verse. When you're released from delusion, you feel a sense of release, but you still have to deal with the results of the delusion. But you don't feel hopeless or faded. You see a light and a way out. You realize I'm not going to start up again with creating negative tendencies. That's an incredible relief. The light's on. You're no longer lost and wandering. It's like when you're lost in a maze. Here's another analogy. You're lost in a maze and you have a drone camera that shows you where you are. And now you have confidence that you can get out and how to get out. And then verse 12, you don't see Mahamudra's sheer clarity by means of classical texts or philosophical systems, whether of the mantras, paramitas, vinaya, sutras, or other collections. In his commentary here, primarily we're pointing out that you don't see the library with the map, right? Cluny Library. You don't see the library. You see how to get there, but you don't see it. Mahamudra and Dzogchen are about recognizing the ultimate nature of mind through directly pointing it out. Sutra level is going to be like a, a map, not a finger pointing right there. Once you're at Cluny, you don't have to keep intending to get there. But you're exercising intention and telling people how to get there once you've arrived. This is spontaneous intention from an enlightened mind. Therefore, at this point, it transcends contaminated karma. Some, this is Lama again, some people don't believe that they deserve to go to Cluny. They feel like they have to do more reading or circumambulations or penance or therapy or more lifetimes of generating good karma. Some people are already at Cluny but don't realize it. Mahamudra is saying, no, Cluny is right there. You don't have to keep getting in your own way with misconceptions. Look past the cars and the other distractions and you see that you can get there. Usually we're in some kind of conflict. Kleshas are a karmic result of this delusional conflict. Karma is when we feel in harmony with our intentions, whether intentional or unintentional. When we're doing something from an awareness perspective, we're not in conflict. Lamana also states that we live in the present and we have to have some hierarchy in the intention of cause and effect, like laws. We need both prajna and jhana. Prajna is practical wisdom, appreciative understanding, and useful hierarchies. Jhana is absolute wisdom. Without prajna and the appreciative awareness of karma, we have situations where people appear to be enlightened, but also appear to be acting appropriate, inappropriately or destructive. Like, you guys know the concept of a dry drunk? Someone who stops drinking, but they have all the behaviors of someone who's drinking heavily. They haven't changed their behavior. They just the one, they changed one thing. Um, or a Christian who's been saved but still acts like a jerk. So that's my best uh, interpretation of the relationship and why you need both. Um, there's many, many paths to Buddha. Mahamudra is a good one. It's not the only one, but karma is I think cuts through and pervades all, all of the, the paths of the yanas. Okay, that's it. Any questions, comments? <laughs> oh, microphone. So Madra Mudra, how closely related is the yamas to the yamas and niyamas in yoga? Is it the same? How closely related is it uh, to what? There's um there's this idea. I know that yoga is um there's this idea in yoga about the yama, the niyama, and all of that. How are you spelling it? Uh Y A M A and then I think the niyama is just N I Y A M A. It might be an S at the end. I don't know what those are. Does anyone know? Uh Elizabeth. Oh, are they? Okay. Okay, those are Hindu terms, and I guess we're talking Buddhism. So thank you. No, I appreciate it. Well, yeah, the, you know, they're both Indian traditions that were around the same time, so there's a lot of overlap. Yoga uses a lot of, I think, uh, Hindu and Buddhist traditions interchangeably, like that. That's my best. Is that helpful? Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, Jack? No? I, I do not, no. But thank you for your talk. It, I feel like I'm learning a lot, yes. Good. Yes, Heather. I wanted to go back to her comment about the good intentions resulting in bad consequences. Is the advice then to just not get involved at all? Well, how do you know that it only has that one consequence? Sure. And that is something I just learned just now. But is that a good over? You have to just maybe not go with them on, on the modern Mahamudra karma issue to just get less involved generally. Then I don't know. I'm going back to that analogy, and I'm wondering what if that person getting fired ended up being a good thing? <laughs> how do we know? We don't always know what um, how something's going to result ultimately. So we are. Good and bad are sometimes our interpretations of good and bad, if that makes sense. So, and it's so complicated. Like, Susan, I, I took your analogy of like a scatter shot with a shotgun. There's all sorts of possible um, effects, if you will. So, um, when, we, when we directly realize we've created a, a, a problematic effect, we can do purification and um, be regretful and remorseful and, and how to do more um, you know, compassionate action like that. That makes sense. So the fact that your intention may have resulted in something negative, just the awareness of that and intention could be the good karma of your, I mean, the beginning intention. Say that again, I'm sorry. So your intended good, uh -huh. it kind of turned out bad. But the fact that you realized that and felt remorse could be the result of your original good intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sense? think so. <laughs> Plus, I don't know, if you think about it, don't expect applause. Sure. <laughs> we, right? We, we, don't, we don't do it for the, um, gee, thank you for saving my job. That was wonderful. You're such a good person. That's not why we would do that. Um, so that altruistic intention is creating wholesome karma, no matter what the uh, possible external circumstances might create, I would think. I don't know if anyone else has a different interpretation. That's just mine. I have a question. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes. Um, it's actually not a question. It's um, uh, just listening to karma and about that, um, uh, say for Heather's last example, it seems that a lot of presumptions are that the result of karma is immediate, but really we don't even know that. It could be in some other lifetime for all we know, right? Right. The, uh, and the, the immediate karmic, result that we face may not be from this lifetime, right? I think that's part of what you're saying is it could from, be from a previous lifetime. So right. um, we and, can't and really we, up on the immediacy of it. When we get uh, um, obsessed with just what you're saying, you know, the good action and the result and whatever, because we're so deluded and, you know, fixated on us and right now, we often will think, okay, right now this is happening, but absolutely, we don't know if it came from Timbuktu or it's going to go to the next, you know, where, so wherever. Right. I think also the over-focus on, on um, negative versus positive or unwholesome versus wholesome karma is partly missing the point. I mean, we could generate a lifetime's worth of good karma and, and merit, but it's exhaustible. It wears out. We could go to the God realm, but we're going to fall from that realm. Um, the goal is to transcend karma through enlightenment. So uh, generating that mind and, and creating, I mean, you need the, the, 
the compassionate actions to get there, but that's only one half of the equation. And so over-focusing on what we're doing or not doing is missing the other side of it, which is, and that's, that could be Mahamudra or any of the other vehicles that help us to realize the nature of mind. Yes. Um, so I, I heard before that if you're pretty much a good person and generate karma, but don't follow the path or know the path, that's when you might go to the God realm and then fall. But it's just- Or a fortunate human rebirth. Sure. Or um, so it's, it's just the intention of becoming enlightened, that second half of, of having good karma. You know, it's, you said it's half of the equation. Well, that part is, I don't know, the wisdom side of it is um, trying to transcend samsara and uh, the delusion that creates the afflictive emotions that help us to continue and perpetuate negative karma. Karma is a relative truth. So it's the intention. So you do good deeds, but the intention to reach the, in, the ultimate. I think it's bodhicitta, right? It's yeah. wisdom mixed with compassion. You okay. can't have one or the other. It's like mm -hmm. the two wings of, of the bird. So you need bodhicitta as yeah. the second the spirit, path. the mind of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how I understand it. <laughs> Is that it? So I'm following up on what Heather was talking about. I think I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so we could get so wrapped up, is what you're saying that we can get so wrapped up in ethical conduct and so wrapped up in trying to generate merit and avoid unwholesome actions that we forget to add the piece that we really the whole idea the whole intention behind the practice is to become enlightened for the benefit of beings so if we forget that piece and are only focused on wholesome and unwholesome actions, then we, when we're really not, we're really not getting where we, we're not gonna get to where we wanna go. I think that's small scope, right? Um, do, doing good uh, may lead right. to a fortunate yeah. rebirth. Right, so if we're only focused on, on our hot chip, on becoming an our hot, then that's where we'll be, we'll become an our hot. But if we focus on enlightenment, then that's what we might be able to attain. And then we're generating um, spontaneous positive action out of our spontaneous compassion. It's not intentional, it just arises spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's when you're, that, that's, that's, that's the wisdom piece. All right, okay, so that's, all right, thank you. Right. So I think, again, that's why Mahamudra, um, it's not bypassing karma, but it's um, telling you not to get so fixated on karma. Okay, great discussion. Um, okay, it's 12 o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and do closing prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of bodhicitta that has not arisen rise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chanwizik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. 
May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, and fading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of optimist compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Jagpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So we have a few announcements. Um, so uh, in August, towards the end of August, a teacher named Kangsa Rinpoche is going to visit us. And um, I don't have many details on that, so that's all I can share at this time. And then, um, and I, and then also, I, I want to check with Susan because I think she might have an announcement, but I'm not certain, not today. Oh, so we have a workshop that's full, so that's how things go around here. But anyway, I thank everyone for coming. And uh, as you can feel how cool our room is, and it's because of the generous generosity of people that come here that our room is cool because it's super hot outside. So if you're able to help us with the AC, there's a box right there. That's our main cost right now, along with our regular uh, bills, but the AC, we, have, we want to keep it going nice and cool here. So thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, Contra Rinpoche, just a plug, um, is an excellent teacher, um, another Tibetan uh, who has the excellent command of the English language, and um, I find him compelling, and, and uh, I learn a lot, so highly encourage you to come. Um, okay, thanks everyone for coming. Stay cool. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, ciao. Good to see you, Roberta. You too, Ellen. Mm -hmm.